part of my agenda to see a more balanced board in the future. Okay. Uh, I mentioned your pricing strategy yes. uh, in jest uh, mm. earlier, which is uh, th th there seems to be you, you have one <coughs> thing and then you buy another thing uh, for a penny. Pricing is very, very competitive in the part of retail yes. that you are in. How do you make those offers affordable to the business? Um, the biggest reason why we're able to do that is we've striven over the past uh, uh, five to ten years now to become as vertically integrated as we can be. So rather than just being a retailer, which is what we were in the, in the early 90s, um, we are a manufacturer of the products, a packer of products. So whether we're selling fruits and nuts that we buy from all sources around the world, you know, we, we've got a packing operation um, up in the Midlands. And again, with uh, manufacturing, sourcing, we just try and ensure that we uh, quality is our is our number one goal. But second to that is as, to to do it as efficiently as possible, and make the cost base as competitive as possible. Mm. So we are everything, you know, a manufacturer, wholesaler, and sort of retailer all in one, um, and that's what enables us. And that, to and sorry to cut in, that helps you have a more efficient business in your view, being in, in control of all those different stages. Yes, as complex as it is, I think uh, for a specialist retailer like ourselves to uh, to survive, we have to become. And, and, and it's good because we're extremely specialist in the ranges that we do. It is very easy to get pricing promotions wrong. Just look at Tesco. Yes, I agree. We, we are in now and, and possibly should have done it years ago, but are engaging with a, a loyalty um, program that we have historically avoided. And what we're finding through the research that we do now is that um, despite there's a great deal of loyalty uh, to our brand from many, many consumers, of course, other companies will stock the products that, that we have made successful or we and the health food industry have made successful. And, you know, that's, that's all fair in, in, uh, in love and war. So, you know, we have to continually be innovative. But we now want to embrace those consumers, have a loyalty program, so we're less reliant on the discount to, to bring consumers into our store. Ah, so promotion is you, you want to wing the company off price promotion. Yes, yeah. I mean, we do quite a compelling job because the feeling is sometimes that there's a large products, lar large amount of products on promotion, and we're constantly promoting. But we do have to attract them into our into our stores, and so price is one of our activities. But it's not the biggest, without a shadow of a doubt. It's our knowledge and training that uh, that, that you know we're unique on, and um, is what we would focus mm, on. So sorry, most. the promotion. The purpose of the promotion is what to get a customer through the door first, or to keep them coming back for repeat business. In other words, if you didn't have the promotion, they wouldn't come back. Oh, I think a lot of them would, but not the quantity that we need to keep coming back. Okay. Peter Otis, thank you very much for that insight into pricing strategy in his business. Well, it's been a, a tough week for some parts of the rag trade. The company, uh, clothing company Aquascutum, famous for that distinctive trench coat, of course, it closed its factory in Corby after calling in the administrators. Meanwhile, Marks and Spencer ran out of some popular lines of knitwear and footwear, and the trendy Superdry lost 40% of its stock market value in a single day after someone in the bookkeeping department mixed up a plus and a minus in the accounts. Uh, Mandy, uh, let's pick up what you were saying about manufacturing and uh, how the control of manufacturing is able to allow you to control the costs in your business uh, and control uncertainty in the business. You've had experiences of investors and financial banker, backers say to you that they're not quite convinced that manufacturing in Britain is the best thing to do. Mm. I think there's um, a sort of historic perception um, that if you're manufacturing, then you do that in the Far East. And it's almost like a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, if you say you're, you want to get your product manufactured, they'll expect it to be in the Far East or Eastern Europe. Um, so when we actually discussed the fact that we wanted to set up manufacture in the UK, we, we had one particular potential investor um, who said, no, if, if you manufacture yourselves and you manufacture in the UK, I'm not going to put money in. So some people will find that shocking. It, it is shocking. It is shocking. But then there were other investors who are quite happy to do that. So I, I think it's really trying to get people um, aware that manufacturing locally is actually less risk 
than you're exposed to if you're manufacturing in the Far East or Eastern Europe. So there are financial backers that think making in Britain is riskier than making in Asia or in China or Vietnam or wherever it happens to be. Because they're not used to it being done. Um, and I think that if we can establish manufacturing in the UK, if we can get engineers, we need far more engineers trained in the UK, if we can get manufacturing back into the UK and it becomes the norm, then there'll be no problem. I think it's anything where you want to do something, just buck the trend and do something slightly different to what's expected. Um, people see that as being risky and they, they don't want to touch that. Maggie, so much for the march of the makers that we were told to expect when the economy well, was rebalanced. I think, to be fair, we do have a, a very strong manufacturing base in Britain. I mean, 8 to 10 percent of, uh, probably 12 percent of GDP. And we've got some fantastically high precision, high quality Rolls-Royce, British Aerospace, nanotechnology. Um, it's just that it's quite small. But I do think what we do have, and the big problem is, over the last 30 years, everybody has sort of run down Britain as a manufacturing source and they still think of it as smokestack factories and, and so forth. I mean, if you go to Bentley cars in, in uh, crew as I've done, you could eat off the floor, you know, hype, it's just superb. And the government, to be fair, have probably done more to boost manufacturing than they've done anything else and they've got a big campaign on at the moment, make it made in Great Britain. But there is but an issue of skills that have been lost yeah. in industries in which we were once very good and uh, Aqua Scooter may well be an example of that you know in the clothing industry the creative director of Burberry saying this That's week right. that uh, there are certain things that they would like to make more of in Britain but they can't because they can't find the work. No, but to be fair, if you were a teenager at school at any time over the last 20 years, you would not have been told go and study embroidery or tailoring or handbag manufacture because, again, Anja Hanmarsh has said the, the same thing. So the whole cycle has to change, doesn't it, of perception and the demand. If the demand is there, then the supply will come. And so maybe all these wonderful skills will come back into our schools. But we do need to you know, get the message out there. Well, if they don't Fantastic. come back, then we can forget all this talk about a rebirth of right. the clothing yeah. industry. In yeah, absolutely. Does it have a future? Oh, yes, I think so. And well, generally, or uh, bits well, of, in I terms mean, of clothing manufacturing, if if yes, the skills are, if skills have died out and but they have those gone those skills away. can be can be learnt very quickly, and that's why we have the further education colleges. So if you can actually turn the courses around, which they claim they can do in six months, then you know if, if young girls at school actually know this is a career, they consider it. Then I would have thought within a year we can get that up and going. But all the right boxes need to be ticked and everybody needs to, to be aware of it. I think it's going to take but a lot longer to get the number of engineers that we need because oh. engineering training obviously takes longer. Mm. And whilst you've factor. got all our bright young things going into the city to try and make their money, mm. um, we, we need to actually encourage and make engineering appealing again mm. because it's a very exciting subject. So perhaps not so many of them going to the city anymore. No, I have a theory about that. I think we ought to call engineers doctors. Yes. If there's a chartered engineer, then you make him a doctor and that I think almost overnight you I transform expect. the status. I mean, in Germany it's well known, isn't it, hair doctor hair and doctor, so forth. Yes, so they're but very you know, why don't we that, think yes. about something like that here? Yeah. We're the home of engineering, aren't we? All the great Imperial College, all the great uh, institutes are here. So I think that's something they should think about. So the potential is there? It's just a matter of esteem and, and, and the public playing its role as well? Yeah, and careers advisors at school, parents, they've all got to sort of get in on it. OK, uh, Maggie, Mandy and Peter, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Well, we got a closer look this week at the royal barge that uh, the Queen will use during her Diamond Jubilee celebrations. Let's take a, a little look at it. Uh, here is the uh, Gloriana, there she is, uh, being made ready for launch into the Thames. See it in all its splendour during the Jubilee. Well, Her Majesty isn't the only one celebrating, uh, keeping going for 60 years. Put the kettle on. Sit back and relax. Here's Catherine Burns. This is how it all started. That